good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, as Amani said, my name is Dr. David Lunn, um, and I teach at SOAS in the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics, uh, primarily on South Asia and South Asian cultural uh, history, literature, uh, and occasionally language. Um, and this evening, uh, I'm here to give you a sense of what it might be like where you come to SOAS to study both South Asia and Southeast Asia. Now, obviously, that's a, a huge uh, region, um, and not all of our um, our study is not always, you know, predicated on the idea of drawing the connections between these kinds of regions. But what I want to talk to you tonight about is precisely uh, something that does straddle those regions and allows us to take evidence um, from both from both sides of what we call the Bay of, Bay of Bengal or Eastern Eastern Indian Ocean. Um, and so, you know, move. I think what we're seeing in in contemporary um, scholarship and contemporary research. Uh, is a move away from what we've called the kind of old area studies paradigm, that's to say, uh, seeing these areas as defined uh, and something we study um, as singularities, but actually we're much more interested in drawing the connections between them and seeing them as historically connected as well as in the contemporary uh, world. So tonight will be very much about um, the past, uh, but I hope you'll be able to see some ways in which it has uh, resonances for the present. And I'm hoping to talk also not just about um, inter-regional uh, connections between South Asia, India in particular in the colonial period, and, and Southeast Asia, and particularly tonight um, Singapore, though with trajectories through uh, what is today Indonesia, um, but also from a kind of interdisciplinary approach. That is to say, how do we answer the kind of questions of the, about the past and about the, pre the present um, through interdisciplinary perspectives, right? So by looking in tonight not just at, at history, as history, um, but also art history um, and, and uh, literary and linguistic studies. Um, so hopefully it'll be um, entertaining and informative all at once, uh, and we'll see how we go. Um, and as I've said, or as Amani said, I'm very happy to take questions at the end, either on anything I've said tonight or on what it's like to study at SOAS, particularly in our MAs in South Asian Area Studies and Southeast Asian and Pacific Asian Studies. So please do feel free to ask myself or, as Amani said, our student ambassador, Jeffrey. So religion in the streets, secret societies, colonial anxieties, and the evidence of a poem. Um, what we're going to be looking at tonight is particularly focused around representations of Muharram uh, in 19th century, in the 19th century. Um, so Muharram in South Asia and Southeast Asia. As an outline of what I'm hoping to get through, we'll be thinking about how Muharram um, is talked about in, in 19th century India, how it is represented visually. And you'll see here a particularly striking example that we'll come to on the right hand side of a, of a man dressed as a tiger, which we'll come to later. And um, we'll be thinking through um, what it means to have uh, representations from this period and accounts from this period uh, that we use as historians today, and particularly um, that the, the, the predominance of colonial uh, accounts and what that means for our understanding of the past. What is particularly um, striking in so many colonial accounts of Muharram, as in so many colonial accounts of so much um, of uh, colonial society, is an element of disdain, right? Um, and I think that we can safely say that that is predicated or based very much on a lack of understanding, a lack of uh, proper awareness of what is going on um, when colonial uh, viewers uh, look at the traditions in, in the places they have uh, colonized and are ruling. Um, what characterizes this so very often is a lack of understanding. So we'll be looking at disdain and particularly this idea of the carnivalesque. We'll then be shifting our focus over to Singapore um, at, that, at that point, part of the uh, what was called the Strait Settlements um, and thinking about the kind of colonial trajectories. That is to say the ways in which colonialism not necessarily created links because in many ways links um, predated uh, the advent of European colonialism between South and Southeast Asia and now well known and well established uh, historical fact, but it changed and in some ways strengthened and in some ways um, distorted uh, those linkages, right? Um, by very virtue of having um, colonized these territories, um, but also through uh, various modes of transportation, either through endangered labor, um, slavery, uh, or um, uh, in this case, we'll be thinking also about um, the, the ways in which um, recruitment to colonial military uh, powers influence the culture in different parts of the, of, well, the Malay, Malay Peninsula. And um, we'll be thinking through colonial anxieties also. We'll be thinking about noise, um, we think particularly about criminality and this idea of secret societies and the so-called mutiny of 1857. 
And then we'll be thinking about alternative uh, modes of or forms of evidence uh, for understanding this, this period and the events therein. Um, and in particular, I'll be drawing our attention to a 19th century Malay poem called the Shire Tabut, or the poem of the tomb effigies. And then in a kind of a uh, broader gesture, a kind of theoretical approach, we might think what ideas of, in Sheldon Pollock's terms, future philology, or in Stephanie Newell's terms, the paracolonial, might offer us for kind of approaching these periods and these questions. Now, first of all, some key terms. Some of this might be extraordinarily um, basic for some of you, but just to make sure we're talking, we're all talking on the, we're all on the same page. Um, when we talk about Muharram, uh, we are talking about the first month of the Islamic calendar. Uh, when we talk about Ashura, um, we're talking about then the 10th day of that month. And this commemorates the martyrdom of Imam Hussein at Karbala um, in, um, well, on the 10th of Muharram in, in uh, the year 61 of the Muslim calendar, um, or 680 AD. Um, now, there are a range of a uh, mourning rituals and commemorative rituals associated with Muharram. Um, Azadari is a, a kind of catch-all term that might uh, encompass uh, this, this range. And this stretches, of course, um, from the Shi heartlands of, of contemporary Iran um, all the way through uh, throughout the Muslim world in many ways, um, with particular uh, permutations in, in different um, in different regions and at different times. And we don't have you know, time this evening to do a, a complete inventory of Muharram practices, um, but we'll be thinking in particular about this idea of Tazia, Tabut, Tabwik, or Jose. And these words, again, are indicative of the kind of spread um, that Muharram uh, commemorations had in certain circumstances under the influence of uh, these colonial trajectories, which is to say this procession of tomb effigies or effigies created to resemble the tombs of Imam Hussein um, and Hassan at Karbala. Um, and to commemorate uh, the, the martyrdom um, in that battle, um, which are processed through the streets, uh, often accompanied by music, and as we'll see, various kinds of carnivalesque forms, right, uh, involving in South Asia in particular, but also into Southeast Asia, dressing up uh, and assuming various kinds of roles. And we'll think about why that happens and what that means, not just for the people involved in it, but also, and I think quite tellingly, uh, for the colonial observers who simply do not understand what it is that they're seeing. Um, and so this idea of Tazia as condolence or mourning, and the Tabwik, the Tabut, the Tazia as perhaps in some dictionaries, the, the Ark of the Covenant and so on. And in, I mean, when we're talking about Tazia in contemporary Iran, we're talking about a theatrical uh, form. Like we're talking about a, a kind of uh, more, a quite distinct uh, form of, of commemoration. Um, now, first of all, I want to sort of introduce you to some of the kind of 19th century uh, depictions of Maharam um, that are really extraordinarily, uh, uh, extraordinarily widespread. We have a, a large collection of 19th century paintings done that um, commemorate or that, that depict uh, the commemorations that take place um, on Ashura uh, and in the month of Maharam. Uh, remembering this um this this martyrdom and i think you can see from this you know particularly um good example of of the genre the kind of thing that's going on and i hope it's sort of visible on your screens uh, reasonably well uh, but you can see here a large procession mainly of men um uh, proceeding along and on the right hand side of the image you can see two or three effigies, right? These tomb effigies, these tabuts, as we as we call them, um, designed to represent, as I've said, the tombs of Imams Hassan and Hussein. Um, and, you know, in the, in, towards the, the left hand side, you can probably just about pick out a, an elephant there with some people on top. There are banners and um, there's no music here. There's no evidence of, of that uh, in particular. But you see women uh, observing in the hill um, and 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 another group of people watching the procession in, in the foreground, right? And so a particularly good example of this coming from the Welcome Collection um, here in London. Um, another example, uh, and again, you know, slightly different um, painting style, um, but still representing a, another um, you know, way in which this was being depicted in the 19th century, right? Um, a collection of Indian costumes, types and occupations is the name of the collection that this comes from. And again, you can see perhaps more elaborate um, tablet constructions here. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see several, uh, you know, um, 
fantastical, somewhat fantastical figures, which you might, if you're at all aware um, of uh, the, the, the traditions surrounding um, Muharram or indeed um, Islam represents the Burak, right? The, the uh, heaven, divine, heavenly uh, figure that carried um, the Prophet Muhammad. Um, some slight differences you may notice here, and again, I'm hoping they might be um, visible on the screen, but if you look in the lower right hand side, you'll see in this case, well, we have women participating um, in the procession. We have our elephant again, um, and also a couple of figures in the center and to the left, um, representing um, something we didn't see in the previous picture, which is music, right? So drummers and, and flute players, and again, very hard to see, um, I'm sure on these screens, but um, a variety of drums being played and a variety of music being played. In this case, some of the musicians dressed in uh, military, European style military uniforms. Right? Oh, I don't. Um, so, um, and again, this is just a sort of selection to say that this is really quite a common uh, genre of, of painting. So here, um, another four examples that, that represent, I think, the kind of styles that we see. You'll notice some commonalities with what we've, we've looked at more closely already, um, watercolors, gouache, uh, and all the rest of it, um, and a variety of depictions of what was fundamentally a very lively uh, commemoration, right? Um, but still here, very much within the realms of the comprehensible, the understandable, um, again, another uh, set of you know, selections of other kinds of paintings associated with Muharram here, generally looking at uh, the shrines as they were being kept and prepared in Imam Baras, um or, or uh, religious um, houses prior to their procession. Now, as we move into the to the later part of the 19th century, we also see um, photography being put to use to document these kinds of events, right? So here, a particularly excellent example um, from around 1880 of a Muharram procession in Baroda, and this is in the in the British Library. And you can see, you know, the very crowded streets, this um, tall and, and elaborate um, tablet or shrine uh, tomb effigy um, that's being paraded down. In fact, there are two there, um, and the, the sense of, of, of real community participation, um, whether in the procession itself um, or on onlookers. And we can think, and we might think um, a little later also about the kind of, uh, the, the ethnographic way, uh, the ethnographic ends to which uh, colonial era photography, photography was also being put in the way that allowed certain kinds of depictions and cataloging of various peoples, again, in the service of, of colonialism. But I want to focus then on a slightly different um, kind of, of um, uh, depiction of Maharam. And this comes in something that is, you know, <laughs> elaborately termed the Maharam scroll, um, which is dated to around 1830 or 1840 um, from Madras, uh, that is to say the presidency of Madras um, or the, the, the region of British uh, or East, at this point East India Company controlled um, India that surrounds um, modern day Chennai. Um, now, this is a around about a six meter long um, scroll uh, that is a continual procession and shows things that we will recognize from some of the others. So the, the depiction in the middle here um, of Atasia, um, but it also shows things that are not quite so immediately decipherable. So for instance, if you can see on the right hand side, the three uh, men following dressed in a way that doesn't comport uh, with the rest of the picture. Um, or we can see the man uh, just well below the Tazia or in front of in the foreground um, in, in, a, in a costume that, again, we don't quite immediately recognize or see as um, connected with the other participants in this procession. Right? And other examples uh, from this scroll um, are similar. Again, I can draw your attention to the to the, the the figures in the at the in the foreground, and they are quite foregrounded in this in, in this um, Maharam scroll in this long painting, um, or uh, you know, and you can see them wearing leopard skin, uh, wearing various kinds of beads, uh, and carrying um, implements that aren't immediately uh, obvious what they are. Or here, and this is the the the. The guy we saw at the um, the opening of this on the right hand side, our man dressed as a tiger, uh, participating in the procession. Um, we might also look at the is it fire pot carrying um, gentleman on the on the left hand side of the screen, proceeding in this um, uh, scene, the the Tazia itself. And so we're, we immediately kind of um, I think provoked to to try and think, well, well, what is this? 
what is this image about? Why is it so dramatically different um, from what we've looked at thus far? Again, those examples that we saw, indicative ones, illustrative ones, there are many, many um, such examples uh, available to look at in various collections in the UK uh, and elsewhere. So what is going on here? Why is this so, so very different? Um, in attempting to understand this, we can turn to a, and this is not a photography, a photographic kind of ethnography, but a written colonial ethnography, which is in this case a, a superlative, uh, superlatively detailed text um, called the Kanun e Islam, right? So the, the customs of Islam. Um, and this was uh, written, we are told, in Urdu uh, in 1832 um, by a gentleman called Jafar Sharif. And in the, in, the, in the language of the frontispiece here, composed under the direction of and translated by Herklotz, right, who was a surgeon in the Madras establishment. So we're still in this kind of region of Southeast India um, of Madras, right, um, with 20 illustrations and all the rest of it. Um, now, we don't have the original Urdu, so it's very hard if this Urdu does in fact exist. Some people have raised questions as to whether this is a, a genuine or not. Um, but we do have Herklotz's um, 1832 uh, translation. And we also have a 1921 uh, reinterpretation of it um, by a gentleman uh, called Crook. So if we're thinking about, for instance, and again, we don't have time to, to, to think about all the various depictions going on here, but if we're thinking about that, that gentleman dressed as a tiger, well, we find a few clues as to what he was doing there um, in this text, right, from Sharif and Herklotz from 1832. Um, in a section uh, on Muharram, dedicated to Muharram, um, they describe uh, the various kinds of fakiri, right, so the people adopting the mode and style of fakirs, um, of uh, religious mendicants, for want of a more um, exact term, and joining in the Muharram processions and the various other events that um, lead up to the Ashura processions on the 10th of Muharram um, and, and, and uh, the kind of commemoration of uh, this. And how do we understand it? You know, but we have this description then of, of those who dress up as the Bach or the tiger, right? Um, and I mean, again, we don't need to read all this out or, or look at it too, in too much detail, but they make an artificial figure of a tiger and the man entering his cell runs, crawling on all fours, playing about in the bazaar. They paint their own bodies in imitation of a tiger. Um, they chain uh, and they tie a chain or a rope uh, to their loins with a long bamboo tail supported and they walk and they run about with a piece of flesh in their mouth, frightening the people, the children run away at the sight of them um, and so on and so forth. So a, a, just a situation we have here then, which is not, it's not immediately understandable what this has to do with the commemoration of the martyrdom um, of the Imam uh, in, in the seventh century AD. Um, you know, we, it's not immediately clear to us what we might should make of this, I would like to suggest, um, especially if we're coming at it um, either from a kind of Western colonial uh, perspective or post-colonial perspective for that matter, um, or indeed um, from within traditions uh, in South Asia. So there was, in the, especially in the late 19th century and early 20th century, a strong tradition of critique um, from within uh, the South Asian Islamic community uh, for these kinds of practices. The suggestion being this was um, jahiliya, right? Or, or, or foolishness um, that had ignorance really, that had nothing to do uh, with quote unquote, the proper practice or practices of Islam. Um, so again, something that is contested uh, within religious traditions as well as something that is not understood um, from without. But this lack of understanding from without is, I think, key uh, to understanding particular modes of colonial condescension uh, and, and um, misinterpretation uh, that were going on in the 19th century. And this kind of condescension informs so much um, of colonial attitudes towards these practices and has real, as we'll see, uh, real life implications um, in, in various contexts. So I mentioned already that this text that we're looking at um, is written by Sharif theoretically in Urdu and translated by Herklotz uh, into English. But the 1921 English edition, which is the one that most people have had more access to uh, given mass uh, ex expanded printing and all the rest of it, um, rather changes uh, people's perceptions of it. And we can see Crook intervening and making additions, right? This comes from the end of the section um, on Muharram. And you'll see on the left, a kind of uh, fairly banal description of the ending of uh, the period. During the 13 festival days, Muslims never do any work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
this changes somewhat in 1921. Um, and particularly, I want to draw your attention to the addition at the end. This, of course, does not apply to duty as public servants or to other work of necessity. The rights observed in southern India, right? Southeast India, we've been mainly talking about Madras. Um, of which the above is mainly an account, differ greatly from the distinctive morning observations, observances in the north, where no buffoonery such as that of the Maharan Fakirs takes place. Now, I think we can, we can do many things with this simple um, paragraph of addition. We can question to what extent um, Crook's assertion that the north and the south are completely different um, in the context of South Asia, in the context of India, um, is true. But we can also, I think, pick up on that word buffoonery, right? Um, where no buffoonery such as that of the Maharan Fakirs takes place. And we can detect in it, I would suggest, a particular kind of late 19th and early 20th century uh, disdain, right? Disdain for uh, indigenous practices and disdain, disdain in particular for religious practices that colonial uh, writers and ethnographers and administrators did not understand and were not capable of understanding um, as being religious, right? As being in any way connected to faith, devotion or genuine expressions of religiosity. And I think um, that lack of understanding is key um, to the kind of policing uh, of this under colonial authorities um, that we see both in India and, as I'm going to turn to now, um, in colonial Singapore. Now, when we go to Singapore, well, here's a couple of images that suggest that there are similar, though not as extensive, um, traditions of from a colonial uh, gaze documenting and depicting the kinds of uh, ex, you know, activities that were taking place. So here is an 1858 uh, watercolour painting representing Maharam in Singapore from a German artist, Schlitter, um, which again, a, a different in style in many ways to what we've seen before, uh, but you can see elements of um, what we saw uh, in, in the previous pictures um, here as well, which is to say the procession and the tazia there at centre of the, the, the tomb effigy. And again, similar to um, a, what we see in the South Asian context, we see in Southeast Asia this uh, move in the 19th century to a kind of fascination of, with uh, photography and the um, use of photography to depict and capture and document the traditions, the, the peoples, um, and the scenes of the, the Orient or, or the East, right? Um, and here, I think also um, telling me very much in a picture postcard format, right? So this idea um, that postcards um, uh, with these kinds of scenes, depicting these kinds of scenes, served as a kind of social currency among um, colonial uh, colonists, right? So um, to be sent back home uh, to families in in, in Britain, um, or indeed to um, family in other parts of, of the empire. Um, so a, a tradition that really springs up, and we had a very interesting exhibition on uh, colonial era postcards at SOAS um, just a year or so ago, based on the work of, uh, of some researchers here. So I mean, it's, it's really a kind of fascinating area to explore as to what um, was going on. But um, with that similarity in, in depictions and, and, and traditions of, of capturing and documenting this um, in artistic forms, we can also note tradition uh, similarities in terms of disdain uh, and incomprehension. This is drawn um, from a, a newspaper account um, from, from, um, uh, from Singapore. Apologies. Uh, and you can see here, we must we must congratulate the public upon the suppression of the last night's procession. The Mohammedans, the Muslims, used to have two in former days. The first was put down some time ago. The second was held for the last time in 1864. These night processions were great nuisances to all persons of other denominations residing in the town, that is, in Singapore, and endangered the safety of the place by the innumerable torches that were carried. They imposed much extra work on the police. We are confident that if the processions of the Mohammedans, the Muslims, and the Hindus were entirely suppressed, the, the and here they use a the term for South Indians, clings, um, would be transformed from riotous and disorderly citizens into peaceful subjects of her most gracious majesty. And you can sort of feel, um, taste the sort of, uh, the sense of imperial um, supremacy and, uh, and, and, and entitlement um, on, on these pages. Um, and this was referring then to the uh, procession, the processions associated with Muharram, um, particularly on Ashura, uh, on the 10th day of Muharram, where the tablet, as we've seen, the, shr the shrine, the tomb effigy, uh, would be pr pr 
paraded through the streets, excuse me. And here are a couple of, of more, um, a couple more observations from uh, the Straits Times, the, the English language colonial newspaper um, in Singapore at the time, which of course still uh, runs, still in print today. And this again from 1864, and this is the pivotal year for what I wanna look at um, at this point, the Tablet Festival, right? Or the, the, the Muharram Festival, which the better informed followers of Muhammad do not observe is now being celebrated, celebrated by the lower classes. And um, the procession of the tablets takes place tonight uh, when as usual, the din of tom-toms, etc., will greet those scarcely gratify the ears of the more quietly disposed portion of the community. And you can, so again, sort of a hyacinth bouquet um, types from middle class um, disdain uh, for noise, for disruption, uh, and for um, the kinds of uh, performative traditions that were associated with uh, Muharram uh, at this time and in this place. And then uh, from the day after, last night, a row on a very large scale, or large scale between two rival tablet to Muharram processions very nearly took place in the town, which it is supposed would have led to a serious breach of the peace, um, but for the prompt steps taken by the police in the matter. But as it was, there have been some disturbances during which missiles of every description in the shape of bricks, bottles, etc., were thrown about, inflicting minor wounds on the mob. And then here is a account from um, some uh, 14 years later uh, on a report for the police force for 1877, again in the Straits Times. Um, when uh, Maxwell tells us that the Muharram, which is a Muslim feast, would in any case lead to quarrels, became most dangerous when the red and white flags have yearly made it the occasion for fighting, stone throwing, etc. And in consequence, permission for the procession has been refused. Now, there's a few references there um, that I think are worth uh, teasing out. I've already suggested that there's a, a huge amount of disdain uh, and distemper and, and unwillingness to accept as authentic or in any way um, valid or valuable, the kinds of religious processions that white, white Western colonists did not understand and did not appreciate, and um, did not see, in fact, as being um, religious in any meaningful um, sense of the term. Noise, tom-toms, din, the, ver the drums, um, the, the, the other musical instruments, and there were, in fact, a whole host of musical instruments um, being played uh, in Muharram processions, um, was noise, was not music, as far as these people were concerned. Um, now, it's interesting to think, well, actually, there was a huge amount of noise in, in the soundscape of Singapore at this time, and a huge amount of religious noise that, of course, um, white colonial um, individuals would not have considered as noise in the same time. So we can think of, in a religious context, the ringing of church bells, which, of course, would have marked the day um, throughout, the firing of cannons, uh, hymns, and other kinds of um, public displays of either religious religious um, activity um, or other kinds of musical activity and bands and, and various um, public performances were, a, were a, um, a, a common feature of colonial times. But that which was done by the quote unquote natives um, was not worthy of the same kind of respect, whether that was Maharan processions or for instance, in the Straits Settlements, Chinese opera. Now, more to the point um, for, for our topic here tonight is this suggestion of the uncontrollable nature of these processions that um, Every year when it happens, we get this from the, from the coverage, right? Every year when this happens, there is always some kind of breach of the peace. There is always some kind of rivalry uh, between the red and white flags in this case. The, and this refers uh, then to what the col uh, colonial authorities understood were secret societies operating um, among uh, the quote unquote native populations and most dangerously forging connections between them. So the idea that there were, again, in the Straits Settlements in Singapore, in Penang and other parts um, of uh, Peninsular Malaya, Malaysia, um, secret societies, not just among uh, Chinese arrivals to the, to the area, but among South Indian, um, Hindu, Muslim uh, communities as well, and indeed incorporating local uh, Malay populations into them. So a real anxiety Right? And the work, the work of Rajesh Rai is particularly interesting on this uh, in suggesting that these anxieties about secret societies and other kinds of uh, formations that might act against colonial interests really come to the fore in the wake of 1857. 1857, of course, being the year of the Indian mutiny, right? Or 
in other terms, rising uh, for war of Indian independence and other ways of portraying it, right? The first the dramatic challenge um, to uh, East India Company rule um, that really destabilized uh, the company fatally uh, and resulted in um, direct uh, crime rule uh, taking you know, um, being uh, imposed over, over British India um, and the dis dismemberment of the East India Company. So we have then, a, and this is only again a selection of sources from the period um, that depict um, these public uh, demonstrations of religiosity and here of, of Muslim religiosity as fundamentally threatening to the colonial order, as something that cannot be understood, as something that um, is a space for uh, secret societies and other uh, distressing elements um, to, to take over the public space, right? And we also have, um, though I don't have you know, any of the text up here for you this evening, we also have extensive documentation from a variety of criminal trials that took place in the wake of this, um, this Muharram in 1864, which was, as we've seen from these uh, accounts, suppressed by the police. Um, the first is the trial that is launched against the supposed ringleaders of the Red Flag Society um, and seeks to uh, suppress these secret societies. Um, whether, if they really existed in the, in the way that the British imagined they did, um, that's a question that remains, I think, um, a little difficult to answer at this point, though I do know of some research um, being done by a colleague in, in Germany that might help clear up some of this. Um, uh, and the second trial ended up being, um, so this was called the, the Great Conspiracy Case. The second trial uh, in, the, in the following year, 1865, was the Police Conspiracy Case, um, where policemen, but, and particularly so-called native policemen, um, were accused of conspiring with the secret societies, of having accepted bribes, uh, and so forth. But most importantly, what we get from this is a sense of, um, well, in, in contemporary terms, what we might call uh, the thin blue line, right? An idea of uh, the police standing um, to, to, you know, keeping order, um, protecting this supposedly vulnerable um, colonial uh, establishment and society, uh, and keeping the, again, quote unquote, natives um, in their place. And this, of course, being a police um, force that in the lower um, ranks was, was staffed by Malays, um, by South Asians, Indians, um, but at the upper levels, uh, inspector and so forth, um, by Europeans, by British um, officers. And so we can see in the colonial archive, in various uh, works of history that have to date um, kind of treated this event in 1864, which was the last time that Maharam was allowed in Singapore, we have a narrative that has become quite accepted of what happened why it happened uh, and how it was uh, dealt with. But we can also find alternative narratives. And this is where a poem um, called the Shahir Tabur, the poem of the tomb effigies, which was written um, in uh, Singapore in 1864 and documents the events of Maharam that year comes into play. Now this um, scroll lay un studied and, and forgotten in, in the university, in, the, in Leiden University Library. Um, there are presumably, there were presumably more copies printed. You can see the kind of on the left hand side here, the lithographed printed version of this, of this scroll. And at the end of this, of this, this one uh, copy that we know survives, um, the last page is a little more, uh, a little harder to read. Um, but uh, this poem tells a very different account um, gives us a very different account of Maharam that year. And I wanted to just briefly uh, demonstrate how it's different in two ways. The first is an account of religiosity, right? So I think what we've seen um, in, in, dis in the colonial disdain, uh, in the colonial uh, anxiety is a sense that what was going on in these kinds of um, assemblages in these kinds of processions was not really very religious at all. Now we don't know much about uh, the gentleman who wrote, in fact, we know almost nothing at all about the gentleman who wrote this, this Malay poem. Um, but uh, we know he was from Ben Kulin, and we which is to say uh, Sumatra, um, and we suspect he may have had um, South Asian ancestry because he uses a lot of words um, in his Malay that have, uh, you know, Indian, um, Hindustani, possibly Bengali um, origins. And um, he does at various points sort of point to um, direct connections to, uh, to um, East or South India. 
Still, um, this question of religiosity is a key one, um, and we but, and we see throughout the poem, right, which is um, some 140 quatrains long, um, we see distinctly religious imagery, right, being invoked in the preparations of for and in the conduct of uh, the Maharam procession. So, for instance, look at at, at quatrain um, 12 there. The light of the multitudes shone so brightly, the drum was beaten with utmost force. Bless Allah and the house of Muhammad. The believers all gathered together in the crowd, in a crowd, you know. Um, through the blessed help of the prophet, the second tablet was lifted up, the music was played with terrible force and burst out of the door. We get a sense, again, in, in poetic terms, um, not just of the, the kind of vibrancy of this, of this uh, procession and of this commemoration, but in particular of the religious devotional aspects. And this frames very much the start um, of the poem and in particular at the end when they, they go to the river and, and, and end um, the, the Maharam procession by submerging um, the, the, the tablet or the, the, the tomb effigy uh, in the water at the end of the year's uh, commemorations. From a, from a historical perspective, however, um, this poem also offers her something quite different, which is to say, who was responsible for the violence uh, that erupted that year? I think we can take it as, un as um, uncontestable that violence did erupt, that there were, was violence um, associated with the procession. Um, but if you read the Malay, the Malay account, the poetic account, um, it has very little to do uh, or, well, it has some to do with, with the various uh, groups that were associated with the different processions taking place, but it also has an awful lot to do with the European policing of the event, and I feel like this has more resonance at the moment than I intended it to have, uh, given recent events in London, but nonetheless. Um, but here we see a, a kind of account um, that really doesn't Dem, uh, sort of suggest that the police are this thin blue line, but in fact were instrumental in provoking the violence. Um, the inspector, he says, was very fierce. He ordered the attack of the Bibada, the, one of the leaders of one of the groups. Um, by the bright night, it looked as, as if people were at war. Praised God, it was a wonder as if in, uh, in battle in the way of Allah, um, it was all the doing of the inspector uh, so that they willingly surrendered. He beat up a few people. He beat up a few people. In the end, they were all arrested. He turned them over to the policemen, in total around 100. Every one of them was of the party. The inspector alone was having fun. The situation took an illegal turn. Bribes were taken with delight. So what can we get from poetry? What can we get um, from reading these kinds of literary and poetic accounts of the past? Quite a lot, I suggest. And this is obviously a very limited um, you know, time we have this evening and a very limited uh, topic that we're looking at, these particular events of Maram in 1864 in Singapore, but we get, um, I think, ways into understanding history through the literary uh, and indeed through the art historical and um, that we might, that we definitely don't get um, from the, the colonial record and the colonial archive and so much recent work and theorizing has been done around the limitations uh, of the colonial archive um, and the constructed nature of it um, in all kinds of fields. Uh, not just in the kind of purely historical, um, but when we come to kind of queer theory and other, other influential work. Um, one concept that I find quite useful in trying to understand these kinds of events and these kinds of um, situations is something developed by Stephanie Newell. Now, Newell's work is very much um, on West Africa, uh, so really nothing directly to do with the South Asian or Southeast Asian situation. Um, but she um, develops an idea of what she calls the paracolonial. Right? Um, so not the colonial per se, but the, the paracolonial. And what does she suggest this means? She says the shift to paracolonial allows, allows us to discard the center periphery uh, motif and instead to analyze in historical and sociological detail the local cultural productivity, which undoubtedly took place over the generations alongside and beyond the British or colonial presence um, as a consequence of the presence, but not as its direct product. I think this allows us to do multiple things. It allows us to obviously to recognize the impact that colonialism had, but to make sure that we are not um, overprivileging that, uh, that impact when it comes to uh, cultural formations in, uh, in any uh, part of the global south or the previously colonized, um, formerly colonized uh, territories. Um, so thinking about that which happens that is alongside colonialism, and that is fundamentally, as I think in this case, um, well illustrated, illegible to uh, colonial uh, knowledge production, right? Events 
um, buffoonery, the carnivalesque, the dressing up, that doesn't make any sense uh, to colonial authorities and therefore allows us to recognize very much the limits of colonial knowledge production and the colonial archive. And finally, um, I want to just throw out uh, the, you know, as someone who works very much on literary uh, sources myself, um, what Sheldon Pollock has uh, offered us um, on what he calls future philology, the fate of a soft science in a hard world. He says, for all the positive value of Orientalism, this is Sa uh, Edward Said's fun foundational and, um, you know, uh, enormously valuable text. One of its deeply deleterious consequences, however much unintended, was to dissuade a whole generation of students from precisely the sort of philological engagement to which at the end of his life Saeed wanted to return. After all, what's the point of learning Arabic or Persian or Sanskrit philology of deeply engaging with these textual worlds if knowledge of the non-West is always already colonized? Well, I think it's not an entirely accurate reading um, of um, Saeed's position necessarily, but it does point to the fact that we have tended not to do the kind of philological work that was so um, compromised by its associations with uh, colonial authority, authority. It's very easy to uh, denigrate ethnographers and anthropologists and, and, and colonial administrators uh, more generally for their kind of complicity in um, colonialism, but the philologists and the dictionary makers and those who studied language and literature were also very much invested in putting their knowledge at the service of colonialism and imperial projects. I'd like to think that that is no longer the case, at least not at SOAS, um, which of course as a colonial institution par excellence has rather moved away uh, from its colonial origins. We hope um, through the study of literature, language and the interdisciplinary approaches to these regions that we can bring new light to bear um, on the uh, atrocities and, uh, and, and behaviors of the past, but also um, on the implications of that past behavior uh, for contemporary situations. So I will stop there. I hope that's been of some interest. I'll stop sharing the screen. And if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Brilliant, thanks so much. Um, yeah, as David said, we've got the Q&A box if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, whether it be about the course specifically or just about student life in general. Um, and our student ambassador or David can answer them. Um, yeah, so I'll just see if there's anything that comes through. I wonder if people are spending time formulating questions <laughs> more hard. Well, seeing as how we've got Jeffrey with us, um, do you maybe want to talk about just very briefly sort of mm. what you're studying and what your experience has been like as us so far? Sure, sure. Uh, so I'm do actually doing an MA here at SOAS, and my MA is the Area Study Program. It is on uh, Southeast uh, and Pacific Asian Studies. So uh, I would say the design of the uh, SOAS program is actually very interdisciplinary. You could really choose and frame your own study uh, according to your uh, interests and background. For example, for me, actually, I, uh, I did, uh, did my undergraduate back in Hong Kong and uh, in, 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 in Hong Kong U on, on art history and comparative literature. So for this program, I could still continue with my focus with uh, uh, art history. So I pick a lot, quite a lot of Southeast Asia uh, art history courses. And for example, I, could, I have also taken like a Southeast Asia uh, film studies class and also a politic class. So you could see, you could really get uh, courses and, and knowledge from multiple disciplines and different department and school across SOAS. And a lot of the uh, teacher, they are very helpful because they understand uh, under this kind of uh, structures, uh, you might be new to the discipline and they are very patient to teach and, and introduce you to, do, to the discipline and answer your questions. And for, I think for all, or at least I think for, for Southeast Asia uh, area study program, there is also a language component uh, that you need to study 
for example, for me, I pick uh, Indonesian as my language comp module. So for for the term, uh, for example, for me, as I am a beginner, so I will take level one, one A and one B uh, Indonesian class uh, uh, throughout the year. But if you have a background in some, uh, one maybe one of the uh, uh, Southeast Asia language, uh, uh, after assessment and test, you could also uh, take higher level of uh, high level courses. Yeah, but this also depends on your previous experience on studying languages. Oh, I see a question. Thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, I just just to to um, in some ways expand on what Jeffrey's just been saying, and and thank you, Zainab, for your questions. What module choices are there? Um, I mean, it varies uh, from year to year. One of the things that characterizes uh, the area studies degrees that we have, so whether it's South Asian studies um, or Southeast Asian and Pacific Asian studies, um, is uh, the, the multidisciplinarity um, of the options that are available. Um, and in fact, that kind of interdisciplinary approach is what characterizes the degrees um, in any meaningful way. So uh, you, you would have to take at least three disciplines um, and no more than, as we talk in terms of credits, no more than 60 credits um, in any one discipline. Um, and that may include language if you wanted to. So language is not a requirement, um, but it's there as an option. Um, we have various uh, languages on offer uh, in any given year, um, but certainly from the South Asian side, Hindi, Urdu, Sanskrit um, as, as standard uh, and Bengali hopefully next year as well. Um, in the Southeast Asian context, Indonesian, um, Thai, uh, Vietnamese, uh, and I'm probably forgetting um, <laughs> a couple of others, somewhat embarrassingly. Um, and in fact, so across those, so and then the 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 options that are available um, are taught most many of them in, in other departments across SOAS, um, in law, politics, anthropology, development, um, history, religions, philosophies, um, arts. Uh, and then in, in this, the department that hosts these degrees, um, literature, uh, film studies, and cultural studies more broadly. So there's a range of options. It does vary somewhat from year to year as departments update their offerings, um, but you'll find an interdisciplinary selection available um, for you. And yes, thank you, um, Amani, for putting up those those links that you'll see there. Or sorry, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey. Sorry, forgive me um, for, for putting up those uh, links um, in, the, in the chat. So I hope okay, that answers brilliant. So I don't see any more questions in the Q and A function. So um, I just want to say a big thank you to David and to Jeffrey for joining today's um, session, and to everyone that's joined. Like I said, this has been recorded, so you will be able to find it on the website when it's been published. Um, and yeah, I hope you all have a lovely evening, and thank I'll you all for say coming. As well, um, if I may, thank you for joining us. And please do feel free to get in touch with any of us if you have questions. My email is uh, readily available on the website as a convener of MA South Asian Studies. Um, and my colleagues on the Southeast Asian side will also be very happy uh, to be in touch. So if you have any questions about this, do feel free uh, to write to us. But otherwise, thank you for coming. All right. Thank you all for coming. Bye.